I have a question for you if you're a Christian watching this today. How easy do you find it to understand the will of God for your life? I don't think I've ever yet met a Christian who said, I find it fantastically easy, don't know why people struggle with it. There's a couple of verses that I want to bring before you and then we'll get into some practical things about how we understand God's will for our lives. The first is from Ephesians chapter 5 and it says this in verse number 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Clear expectation that we would as Christians come to understand God's will for our lives. And the other verse is very well known in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 6. Having said, in verse number five, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, then says in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And that promise there that says that if we seek the Lord and put him first and are genuinely desiring his will, then the promise of scripture is that he will guide us the way that we want he wants us to go. Now God doesn't leave us in the dark on these things, rather he wants us to be dependent upon him. And even though sometimes we may not find it easy, that's not because God is not wanting to guide us, but rather he's wanting us to be dependent upon him. I've got some headings to think about this subject with you. And the first one is to think about the Saviour's example. The Lord Jesus in everything, of course, is the great example for the Christian and he perfectly lived in the will of God. We think of him coming into the world, Hebrews chapter 10, I am come to do thy will, O my God. We think of him in childhood there in Luke chapter 2 as he is about to enter into teenage and he said, Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? We think of him there with the uh, woman at the well as he says to the disciples, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And then towards the end of his uh, pathway down here he said nevertheless not my will but thine be done even Christ pleased not himself and we find interestingly that being in the will of God as the Lord Jesus set us the perfect example for doing it didn't mean prosperity it didn't mean an absence of suffering now sometimes it is God's will that Christians have a prosperous life. Sometimes it's God's will that they go through life with what appears to be minimal suffering. However, the example of the Lord Jesus shows to us that we can be in the will of God and be those that don't necessarily have an abundance of the world's goods and can go through a pathway that is particularly difficult. So having thought about the Saviour uh, in his example, let's think secondly about the Scriptures. I want to divide this into two parts. There's the direct commands of Scripture and then there are the less specific but nonetheless very helpful principles that the Scriptures would bring before us. So there are many situations where the Word of God has put direct commands uh, down on the page for us. For this is the will of God, uh, even your sanctification. It would be 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 5 has another example, giving thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. And there are plenty of other direct commands in scripture where God is bringing before us exactly what his will is. We don't need to pray about it anymore. We don't need to uh, worry about it in, in any way. We just get on and do it. And God has put many direct commands, giving thanks, living a pure life, being baptized, certain things to do with the way that we gather together as, as Christians. And there are plenty of situations where there is a direct command from God as to what he wants us to do in a circumstance. But there are other situations where there are principles laid down in scripture. And we'll need to pray about how we apply them, but nonetheless, they can be really helpful in thinking about what God's will would be. How would the Lord Jesus have acted would be an example. We think of how the Lord Jesus said in John 13, if I, your Lord and Master, the Lord Jesus did certain things, he acted in a particular way. And we think too of how Peter brings before us how that Christ has set us an example. The idea there is uh, when we were learning to, to do handwriting, uh, if we can remember back to that at school, we would have a, a guide that we would we would write underneath and we would seek to copy the writing. That's the idea behind that, that word there. 
There are other things too. Is my behaviour consistent with the Lord Jesus being with me and the indwelling Holy Spirit? Remember the clear uh, teaching of scripture is if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Uh, in Romans 8 and in Galatians, uh, it says that because we are sons, God has sent forth his spirit uh, into our hearts. Every Christian indwelt by the spirit of God from the moment of salvation. However, we're told to grieve not the Holy Spirit. We should be living a life that is consistent with that. Does our behavior set a good example towards others? How would I feel if others did what I was doing? Now, I'm not talking about variations in our service and things like that, but at a moral level and so on. Remember how that Paul could say to those at Corinth that he was an example to them as he sought to follow the example of Christ. Would the behavior that I'm considering be consistent with the gospel? Does it bring glory to God? 1 Corinthians 10 says that in everything we do, we should be seeking to bring glory to God. If there is time, money, ability or effort involved in what I'm thinking of doing, is it the best use of those things? The biblical principle of stewardship is important here. God gives us these things, none of them are our own, and we are to use them remembering that they belong to him. Now, you may say, well, what I'm thinking of doing is good, it's okay, but we need to think about whether or not it's the best. Sometimes the good can be the enemy of the best. Is it the way that the Lord wants that thing to be used? Are our motives pure? Will the judgment seat that every believer will uh, it will stand before when the Lord Jesus assesses our lives. How are we feel in that day? Will there be motives that are different to our actions? Does it show love towards others? Are there any implications for my future service? We think about how Joseph, perhaps particularly, and there'll be other examples as well of how people acted in certain ways and it had implications. And it could be good, it could be bad for my future service, and that's an important thing. Best not to compromise our long-term usefulness for a moment's indiscretion or for a short-term gain as we might see it to be. Fourthly, what about God's will and the sanctuary? We've thought about the Saviour's example, we've thought about the scriptures in specific terms and the scriptures in general terms. What about the sanctuary? If we want to know God's will, let's ask him. God wants to guide and lead us. I remember one day when I was a young Christian, I was riding along on my bike and it was a nice day, the sky was nice and blue, and I thought, wouldn't it just be helpful here if God just wrote his will in the sky for me? I was praying about a particular issue, I wasn't quite sure what to do. And as I rode along, God very much brought that verse to mind, the just shall live by faith. It is going to take faith to do the will of God. As I pray about things, I'm not going to get an email or a message pop up on my phone and say, this is the thing to do. We're going to have to act in faith. Now, God doesn't do things to confuse us or to perplex us. He wants us to pray about things. And it may well be helpful to keep a record of when God has guided us in the past, not so that we're going to just do the same thing all over again, but just as that sense of reassurance that God guided us in the past and he will guide us again in the new circumstances that we are in. We need to pray not only for what God wants us to do, but when he wants to do it and how. Perfectly possible, isn't it, to do the right thing at the wrong time. Perfectly possible to do the right thing at the right time, but in the wrong way. How we need to be praying about all three of those so that we would be in the will of God, both in terms of the action, the timing, and the manner that we go about doing it. Now, maybe there are situations where we're not completely sure about something, and it's entirely appropriate that we come before God and we ask him for his will on a matter. We think about how particularly the Apostle Paul prayed about the thorn in his flesh, and God revealed to him that it was his will, God's will, for that problem, that issue to stay, but that God would give the grace to go through with it. And that's an important thing, isn't it, about the will of God as we come before him in prayer, 
that we have the attitude of the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And it may be that there are times when God takes the issue away. There may be other situations where God gives us the help to go through the situation with him. So we've thought about some things to do with the will of God. Have a look at the second video where we'll think about what's the role of circumstances and, and God's spirit and things like that as we seek to be those that live in the will of God.